Ladies and gentlemen, in bidding you a welcome here to the Athlone Civic Centre, it is with great pleasure that I look at the hall from this side. There are very few meetings where you find the hall is full before starting time. Our guest this evening is really no guest at all. It's become a household word not only in the Cape, not only in South Africa, but internationally. It's Brother Ahmad Dirat from Durban. Brother Ahmad, we wish you a hearty welcome once again in Cape Town. What you will hear tonight dates back, has its origin in America. Brother Ahmad Dirat will give us tonight a preview of what, if Almighty Allah spares him, inshallah, will take place on the 7th of August in Birmingham in the United Kingdom. Brother Ahmad had a debate in America with Jimmy Swaggart, and he needs no introduction, does he? And after that, a challenge was extended to the Muslims. And the one who took up the challenge is Brother Ahmadira. The challenge was extended by Dr. Anis Shorosh, who is a doctor of divinity, and he gained his doctorate in America. The question might well be asked, what's he doing in America? Or why is he there? You know, when the Jews came and they grabbed the land of the Arabs, Dr. Anis, a Palestinian Christian, also had to flee. And he fled to America, where he became uh, a student of Christianity and became, uh, he gained his doctorate. So he has extended the challenge to the Muslims and it was taken up by, Dr. Ahmad, by Brother Ahmad Dira and it will take place in Birmingham, on the United Kingdom, on the 7th of August of this year. Uh, needless to say, we wish Brother Ahmad well and we will be following that with intense interest. So what you will do tonight, inshallah, is to treat the subject and to address the topic of the two out of the three great monotheistic religions, Islam and Christianity, both laying claim to a holy book. He will address the subject on which is God's word. Is it the Quran or is it the Injil, the Holy Bible? And whereas I will remind the brothers once again after the talk, this is a lecture with a difference that there will be question time. And I will treat that again when, I, when the time comes. But I appeal to all those people who have any intention of putting questions tonight, please, not to scout and, and flip around references now, please pay attention to what is being said. Because I have been around before, and people tend to ask questions totally unrelated to what was being said. Please pay attention to what is being said, and put those questions relating to that. I, without any further ado, I introduce you to Brother Ahmad Dirat. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul la in jitamat al-insu wal-jinnu, ala an yatu bi misli hada al-Quran, la yatu na bi mislihi. وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْدُهُمْ لِبَعْدٍ زَحِيرًا صَدَقَ اللَّهُ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ مَرَ نَزِيمٌ Mr. Chairman and brethren, the subject of this evening's discussion, the Qur'an or the Bible has actually been forced upon me. Usually, I have been discussing the Bible, I had debates about the Bible, is the Bible God's word? But this Palestinian Arab Christian, Knowing Arabic, he had already one debate with me in the Royal Albert Hall in London on the subject is Jesus God. The tape is available, the videotape. He challenged me once more again. He says, now this time he wants to involve the Quran. And we were forced to accept that challenge. So we are going to discuss this. Tonight, this is a preview. A view beforehand I'm giving you of what is expected to happen. We don't know whether it actually happens this way, but this is an exercise, I believe, in a trial run, 
Islam expects every Muslim, you see, to be ready and fit for any eventuality. Allah wants us Muslims to be ever ready. He says, وَعَعِدُّ لَهُمْ مُسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ Say, and get ready against them, your strength to the utmost of your power. وَمِنْ رِبَاتِ الْخَيْلِ Even including steeds of war, meaning the most sophisticated weapons of the time. This is our instruction, but unfortunately, we are, have not been following it. Therefore, we find ourselves in the plight in which we are. But preparation, very, very important. And this is, I'm grateful to my brethren here for creating this opportunity for me to have this practice run about this debate that is going to take place. Now, the subject, the Quran or the Bible, which is God's word. This one wonderful thing, many wonderful things about this glorious book, the Quran, the holy book, the Quran is that the Quran proves itself. This is the beauty about Allah's Kalam. Any charge, any charge you have against this book, the enemies of God, they might allege against this book, the Quran answers, it defends itself. It doesn't need you or me. What can happen is that we can let the book down by not knowing. But everything, anything, that the man throws at you, Allah defends his own book. If it is his book, he must defend it himself. So this subject, Quran, you know, the Quran is the only book which names itself. And the Quran makes the claim, Allah makes the claim in the Quran that this is my book. He makes the claim. I quote you, Bismillah rahman rahim Ar-Rahman Allam al-Qur'an That it is Ar-Rahman, the merciful God, it is He who has revealed the Qur'an. Allah Bari Ta'ala Himself says, I have revealed the book. This is from Surah Ar-Rahman, chapter 55, ayah number 1 and 2. Allah makes the claim. And again in Surah Gashia, Jashia, that is chapter 45, again ayah number 1 and 2, he says, Allah says, تَنزِيلُ الْكِتَابِ مِنَ اللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ That the revelation of the book, this book, is from Allah, the exalted in power, full of wisdom. Allah makes the claim that this is my book. And it is He who has revealed it. When we look at the Bible, the Holy Bible, this Bible is a... Of course, the Bible of the Jews and the Christians put together. Jews and Christians are all involved in this book. Because what they call, what we is called the Old Testament is the Bible of the Jews. The New Testament and Old put together is the Bible of the Christians. The Old is Bible of the Jews. So the whole Bible consists of Jews as well as Christians. We are dealing with them both. This word Bible is not in the Bible. You know, this book here I have in my hand is an encyclopedia of 66 books. It's like a library of 66 books inside. But there's no way in these 66 books is the word Bible written. Nowhere does it say Bible. So God says, this Bible is my book. Nowhere. The name is not there and the claim is not there. So, we say, with regards to the Quran, Allah challenges mankind. He challenges them to say, this is my book. And He wants you to accept it as such. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا That if you have any doubts with regards to what we have revealed to our servant Muhammad from time to time, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّمْ مِثْلِهِ then produce a surah, a chapter like it. And call your witnesses, anyone besides Allah, in kuntum swadikin, if you are speaking the truth, and bring your witnesses as proof to say, this is anywhere like the book that Allah has given to his servant, an ummi prophet, one who doesn't know how to read or write. He has is presenting to you chapters and beautiful verses. Come on, you produce one like it. Illam tafalu, Allah says, and you will not be able to do it. Walam tafalu, and you will never ever be able to produce the like thereof. Fine. 
فإن لم تفعلوا ولن تفعلوا فاتقوا النار التي وقودها الناس والحجارة عدد للكافرين then prepare yourself for the fuel for hell for fuel the fire whose fuel is men and stones burns up everything this is the challenge 1400 years now the challenge stands and nobody the Arab the, the pagan mushriks of Mecca they couldn't produce anything like it and in the Christian world today I'm sorry in the Muslim world today there are in Egypt alone more than 10 million Christian Arab Christians so our people generally they don't know we think every Arab is a Muslim in the Lebanon you know the people who massacred the Palestinians Shabra and Shatila who were they they were Arab Christians 10 million they are boasting now in Egypt alone that there are 10 million Arab Christians speaking Arabic and they are masters of the language even the Westerner when he, he when he masters Arabic we have to go to him to learn meanings of words you know that whenever our learned people you know when they refer to uh, Arabic words they go to what is called Lane's lexicon who is Lane Englishman famous famous in the in the world the lane's lexicon we go to him you know what is the meaning of this word what is the root word and how it originate all that we go to these non-muslims writings books have been written grammar by the by the christians by the christians arabic grammar here is a book this is a book this is a part of what they now call the harmony of the gospel this is now addressed to Muslims. You see, when you read the Arabic Bible, the Arabic Bible, and when you compare with the Arabic of the Quran, it's chalk and cheese. It's poles apart, worlds of different. There's no comparison whatsoever. So now, what they call it contextualization. It's a new word. They want to create now a feeling in the Muslim that this sounds like the Quran they borrow words from the Quran and start the book here this new publication how to catch the Arab Muslim they start with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim every chapter now it begins now Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim to compete with the Quran because every chapter of the Quran begins Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and terms and expressions phrases are borrowed from the Quran into this book in the so-called New Testament, they borrow it. So when the Muslim reads it, it sounds like my own. Easier to catch fish. Deception. They have developed deception as an art. Here in Cape Town. This book here. Al-Kitab. Look at it. How beautiful. Al-Kitab. Look at the calligraphy. This is Christian. When you see this, say Al-Kitab. You say, immediately comes to mind. Bismillah. There it is. Christian. This is Christian. And I show you deception as an art. Look at this. Beautiful, beautiful. Look at this sticker. Golden sticker. Look at this. I know it's difficult. But I think once it is on, 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 on video, you'll be able to see it at close quarters. Deception. An art. Look at this. I'm asking people, Arabs. And in Pakistan, I said, look, what is this? What is this? Read it. Read it, brother. Say, what is this? Yes, yes, yes. Everybody says, Allah Muhammad. I said, I read it like that too, Allah Muhammad. This is not Allah Muhammad. This is Allah Muhabba. Catching fish, fish. They have developed all this as an art. How to catch the Muslim fish? What bait to use? You see? Because this is a God is love. But it looks like anybody, everybody. I caught an old Arab in Jeddah. I showed it to him, Ya, ya Sheikh, have a look at this. So he said, Allah Muhammad. I said, Ya Sheikh, have another good look. He said, Allah Muhammad. I said, Ya Akhi, look, have a good look. What does it say? Then he said, Allah Muhabba. An Arab can be caught. <laughs> I can be caught. What of the masses? Fishing, fishing, fishing. Deceit, deceit. They have developed it as an art. When they can do all that, Allah says, produce a chapter like it this is what is asked of you produce something like it and Allah says you'll never be able to do it even if you help one another it can't be done now let us look at the Bible what it says that is say 
I said, there's no way in the whole of the Christian Bible, this encyclopedia, where it says, this is my book. God says, this is my book. No way. On the contrary, you open one of the books called the Gospel of St. Luke. Gospel of St. Luke. In the so-called Injil. The Christians say Injil. So let's have a look at this Gospel of St. Luke. Chapter 1, verse 1, he begins. Luke. See, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also. Seeing that others have done work, they have written down things, narration about things happening among us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding from the very first, better educated than most, the most learned of these Christian writers, the only Gentile writer, all the books of the Bible, written by 40 different persons, all Jews, 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 Jews. Here is a Gentile. Luke is a Gentile, the only Gentile writer, and he's telling you that it seemed good to me also. You can do the job, why can't I? So, he's telling you why he wrote, what inspired him. You, you, you. If you can do it, why can't I do it? Why can't I do a better job? I'm better educated than you. Now, let us hear from themselves what they themselves say. They have written a book. On which book? My book was based. Is the Bible God's word? It was being given out. It was being given out as people came in. Is the Bible God's word? But this book of mine was based on this other book. Christian book. It says, is the Bible the word of God? Same type of question mark. It is written by a certain Dr. Graham Scroggy. Don't worry about the name. It is published by the Moody Bible Institute. Moody Bible Institute. No, it's a very, it's a very, um, you know, prestigious, prestigious religious body in America. And they published it. In this book, this book is trying to prove that the Bible is God's word. There, we get it from the horse's mouth. They say this is God's word and they are trying to prove. And in trying to prove this Dr. Scroggy, he quotes a dirt, certain Dr. Joseph Parker. We have a lot of Parkers here, you know. Easy to remember. This is Joseph Parker. They'll never forget Joseph Parker. On page 22 and 23 he says, What a book is the Bible? Typical in American. You'll hear Shorosh if you see the tape number 27 when he's addressing that audience in the Royal Albert Hall. He said, what a lovely bunch of people. You. <laughs> so, same typical element. What a book is the Bible. In the mere matter of variety of contents. Variety of contents. Things different, different. You know, as, as we are told, that variety is the spice of life. You have that? Variety, variety. You want different types of masalas in your curries, you know. It says variety. It says in the mere matter of variety of contents. And I can give you examples, keep you whole night here. Just giving you the variety of contents and bore you to death. I don't want to do that. It says in the matter, mere matter of variety of contents, it says whole pages are taken up with obscure names. I'm only quoting obscure names, names you never heard before. Obscure names. And more is told of a genealogy than of the day of judgment. So stories are half told. Stories are half told. And the night falls before we can tell where victory lay. Where is there anything in the religious literature of mankind to correspond with this? There isn't. It says QED. Proof that this is God's word. Actually, he's proving that this is the hodgepodge. It's a hodgepodge of a book. That's what he's telling you. But the beautiful necklace of words, you see the way they link it together, the words, the phrases, it tantalizes man. You listen to it and you fall head over heels. You get mesmerized. What a book. I said, now, let us examine it. Number one. He said, whole pages are taken up with obscure names. Obscure names... Name you never heard before in your life 
and you are not likely to hear them in the future. Nobody remembers, nobody knows. I give you example. Just talking is easy. I give you example. I am quoting from the first book of Chronicles, Chronicles, chapter 1, verse 11, from the Holy Bible. Mizraim begot Ludim, Anamim, Lehabim, Naptuhim, Patrusim, Kasluhim. Look, any of you, I said there are 50,000 here. 50,000 Christians, and if I ask anyone, is there a single Ludim, Anamim, Lahabim, Naptuhim, Patrusim, Kasluhim here? And they won't be. But this is in the Holy Bible, such beautiful names. You never heard of it? This is no. Nobody heard of it. This is the Holy Bible. I'm reading. See, obscure names. And you're never likely to hear in your lifetime. If you live to a hundred, you won't hear them again. Except from Muhammad Dida. And at one of my meetings in the Middle East, I had a Palestinian Muslim brother as a chairman, Dr. Muawiyah Shunar of Dubai. So I'm asking him, the chairman. I said, Doctor, have you heard these names before? He says, No. I said, Shame on you. You know why? I said, These are your forefathers. Because he is a Palestinian Muslim, you see. I said, these are your forefathers. That's what the Bible says. That these are from whom came the Philistines. You Palestinians, your forefathers. You don't know their names even. Shame on you. <laughs> Same thing I can tell this Dr. Anishor. She is also Palestinian. I said, have you heard the names before? Most probably. I expect, unless somebody texts him, tells him, hey, that's going to ask you this question. It doesn't matter. He might say, yes, I said, somebody informed you. Hmm? I'll ask him, I said, look, have you heard these names before? Impossible for him to say yes. Unless somebody has a telex as him now and say, hey, that's going to ask you this question. No, man, you can do that. <laughs> so, names like this. Your ancestors, your grandfathers, and nobody knows the name. The Muslim Palestinian doesn't know and the Christian Palestinian doesn't know. See, obscure names. So, whole pages are taken up. Oh. And more is told of a genealogy than of the Day of Judgment. You know what's genealogy? Telling you about your ancestors. Your, who was your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather going back to 50 generations. More is told about that than of the day of judgment. The Holy Quran, Allah's Kalam, one third of the Quran is dealing with Yawm al Qiyamah, the last day, the day of judgment. Says, Look out, beyond God, hell is no joke. Heaven, hell, day of judgment, one third of the Quran deals with that. Here, we are told, more is told of a genealogy than of the day of judgment. Mere statement. I said, no, 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 look, let me show it to you. Let me show it to you. Uh, the Chinese have a saying, one picture is worth 10,000 words. One picture. Here, I give you two pictures. This. See so this? This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It says, Matthew. Chapter 1, verse 1, it begins, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brethren, and Judah begot Pharaoh and Zarah of Tamar, and on and on and on. And, on. and this is Luke. This is the genealogies of Jesus Christ. Both. Between the two, by Matthew and Luke, they give you 66 fathers and grandfathers to Jesus Christ. 66. And out of this list, two lists, there's only one name common to both. They are all contradictory. They're different, different lists. And both are inspired by God Almighty. The Holy Ghost tells them what to write and they wrote. And only one name is common to both out of the 66 names. And that one is Joseph the carpenter, who is not supposed to be there. <laughs> no, amazing. Amazing. I'm asking them, I said, look. God Almighty dictates the genealogy of his son, his son, in inverted commas. That's what they say. Jesus Christ is his son. God Almighty is dictating the genealogy of his son. And he takes the trouble of dictating 66 names. And he keeps himself out of it. What is he telling you? What is he telling you? You tell me. My son, the young man there, for example. I dictate to two journalists the genealogy of my son and I give 66 fathers and grandfathers for my son but I'm not one of them what am I telling you? <laughs> I mean, 
amazing. A man who had no father <laughs> believed that he was born miraculously. And you take the trouble of giving 66 names, and out of that, the author himself, the progenitor, if at all, he is absent. So more is told of a genealogy than of the day of judgment. Little wonder Allah says, so woe to them who write the book with their own hands. Then they say this is from Allah. That they may reap some small reward, some benefit. So woe to them for what their hands do write. And woe to them for what they earn. Stories are half told. I'm still con I'm only giving you explanation because the man has spoken beautiful words and phrases. I want to tell you, now look how nice he's putting all these things. So stories are half told. And the night falls. I mean, there's a close. Before we can tell, we victory. What happened? What's the outcome? Hmm, nothing. You know nothing. <laughs> I give you. <laughs> Matthew. Matthew. Chapter 27, verses 52 and 53. It speaks about wandering corpses, corpses, you know, dead bodies coming out of the graves and walking the streets of Jerusalem. And the graves were opened, the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints, you know, those goodly people that were dead and buried for centuries, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, means they were dead, were raised. And coming out of the graves, after his resurrection, after his alleged resurrection of Jesus Christ, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Left, right, left, left. They marched into Jerusalem. These dead people, they came out with their napkins or with their shrouds or the skeletons and they walked the streets of Jerusalem. That's what Matthew says. But out of the 27 books of the New Testament, amazing, he's the only guy who saw it. Can you imagine? Look, people walking, dead people coming out of the graves from your graveyard here. What graveyard? And he's walking down Claremont or, or here at Dali Street. And nobody sees it. No newspaper except one guy somewhere. Can you imagine such a situation? Nobody has ever. And then what happened to them? Look, they just tell you they came out and they walked the streets. What happened? Did they go and find the wives and children? Hmm? Go to bed again with them? What, what did they do? Or did they go back to into the grave? If they did, why would they want to go back? Huh? Once you got freedom from the grave, you want to go back? What happened, man? Tell us! No. Story closed. Finish. No more. Not one word more by Matthew or by anybody else. <laughs> Actually, another, just one verse. Book of Judges. Judges. This is the name of another book in the Bible. Chapter 3, verse 31. I'm reading. So after him, after him was Shamgar. Never heard the name before. Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 Palestinians with an ox goad. And he also delivered Israel. One Jewish boy with this stick. I read about this stick first, you know, when I was young. I'm reading the book of Acts in the New Testament, chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. It says, Paul was going to Damascus and he hears a voice, supposed to be the voice of Jesus from heaven. He says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why are you worrying me? Why kickest thyself against the pricks? So, man, he says, what is this? What kind of a holy book is this? So I started going and asking priests, what is this? Nobody could tell. Nobody, nobody. Now in the newest, latest, new test, a new, latest Bible, the King James Version, they said, goad. Why kick us ourselves against the goad? I'm asking, do people know what is a goad? Nobody knows. So I said, look, this is a goad. This is a cattle prodder, you know, to make the cattle, ox wagon. You know, the days of the ox wagon, the poor thing is going slow, slow, so you give it a one, this is a spike stick. It's a stick with a spike in the front. They call it a cattle prodder, call it a goad, call it what you like. With this one stick, one Jewish boy killed 600 Palestinians. With this stick. 
I want to know what were the Palestinians doing. Hey, damn fools, why did they run away, man? I'm asking this Palestinian, Dr. Anish Shorosh, I'll ask him. I said, look, tell me, man, what were you people doing? If you only spat on that guy, who would have suffocated. <laughs> anyway, with this stick, you can't destroy 600 snowmen. You know that? With this stick. You believe that? I say, you believe that? Once you believe that, psychologically, you are a defeated people. Gone for good. You can never stand up for the Jews. Never. Because if God Almighty had this destiny for you, that one Jewish boy can kill 600 of you. One little David killed a giant, Jalud. The Jews, they make a big story of it. The Christians make a big story of it. And we make a big story of it. We say, Wakatala Dawud of Jaluta, and Dawud killed Jalud. Okay. This guy, he beats the whole bang lot. He killed 600 with a stick and nobody knows about it. Nobody. By God, I tell you, ask any Christian missionary, I say, you know Shamgar? Ask him, you know Shamgar? So who's that? <laughs> Allah gives us a test. I'll give you numerous tests from the Quran, from the Bible, how to find out whether a book is from God or not. He gives us a test. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Afala yatadabbarun al-Qur'an. He says, do they not consider the Qur'an with care? Walau kana min indi ghayri Allah. Had it been from anyone other than Allah, lawajadu fih ikhtilafan kasira. You would have found in it many discrepancies, many contradictions. Natural. No human being can ever remain consistent in his preaching for 23 years. No human being. It's not human. You say something today, and according to the changing circumstances, you also change. Your mind is changing, and you're not aware that you're changing. You change. Man changes. This book, this book of God, consistent in whatever it preaches throughout. But it's a test which we are to apply to the Quran as well as to the Bible. Now, Allah challenges. He says, you come forward. You Christians, come forward. Show us. We will try and explain to you. You see, where the sickness is, we'll explain to you. But now, let us analyze the Bible because it came first. I'm quoting from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 18, verse 9. It says, verse 9, that the saying might be fulfilled. A prophecy that had been made, that saying might be fulfilled. Which he spoke. Who spoke? He said, Jesus spoke. His saying might be fulfilled what he had said. In inverted commas, it says a quotation, of those whom you gave me, he's talking to God Almighty, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. He's telling Allah, of those you gave me, I have lost none. Close of inverted commas. This is what Jesus spoke. None. You know what is none? Not one. Alright? You don't need a dictionary for that. None means not one. Not a single one. That's what it means. None means not one. And that is now in this Bible, the Red Letter Bible. This is the Red Letter Bible, which was presented to me by Dr. Anish Rosh at the last debate. He scored a point. He says, you know when we Arabs, when we go to meet a friend, we don't go empty-handed. So he presented this book to me in a nice green cover. I didn't know what it was inside. But when I went home, I checked it up. Beautiful. Very expensive Bible, this. Red letter Bible. Everything that Jesus spoke is in red. So easy to find. You don't have to now think, who said this? Oh, is inverted commas all right? But did Jesus say that? Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry. Anything in red, Jesus. So that makes my task easier to find out that is this Injil? You know, the Muslims get caught out. The Arab Muslim also. I say what the Bible says about Muhammad. So the Arab translator says what the Injil says about Muhammad. I can understand he's saying Injil and in Arabic he's saying about Muhammad. I say, I didn't say Injil, Akhi. I said what the Bible says about Muhammad. So he changes. He said what the Torah says about Muhammad. I said, I didn't say Torah, I said Bible. 
Bible is not Torah, it's not Zabur, it's not Injil. Don't you see you get caught out. So this little book of mine explains to you what is Torah, what is Zabur, what is Injil. You must get it. If you haven't got it yet, get it. It's free. Right. So this, ta this book makes my task easier. So I start looking for everything that Jesus spoke in the New Testament. So I find that 21 out of 27 books of the New Testament, there are 27 books in the so-called Injil of the Christians, 21 out of 27 has not got even a red dot or a dash or a doodle. Leave out being the word of God is not even the word of Jesus. It is not even quoted. And in living Bible, there's a new another, which the evangelists, the preachers use, the living Bible. 23 out of 27, there's not even a red dot or a dash or a doodle, not even a smudge. That's what you give me. You're telling me this is not even the words of Jesus. Leave out God's word, it's not even the words of and not even a word is quoted. But this particular one is in red. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Is in red. That means this is what Jesus said. But the same John, in chapter 17, a chapter before 18, in verse 12 he says, same Jesus now he says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. He's kept them in that straight path. Whom you gave, uh, those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, except one. None but one. So that means there is a contradiction. Jesus in the next chapter, the same Holy Ghost tells the same John to write, he, lost, he said, I lost none. Now he said, I have lost only one. <laughs> is it one or none? <laughs> so, here is another King James Version. That's a King James Version. This is also another red letter Bible. Cost 43 rands 90 cents for this. You know our Quran we are selling you, brothers, 2,000 pages. This Quran, 10 rands. 10 rands. And if I have the chance, inshallah, the next time when I come along, if I can supply them enough, it will be 5 rands each. 5 rands each. 2,000 pages. 5 rands each, inshallah. At the moment, they are 10 rands. It's cheap. Wallah, is dirt cheap. 43 rands, 90 cents I paid for this. Plus GST. <laughs> this is also a red letter Bible. So I open the same verse, John chapter 18, verse 9, and it's in black. That means these editors, they don't believe it was the word of Jesus. I could see that can't be Jesus contradicting himself, the Holy Ghost contradicting himself, but he puts it in black. So can you see? What I see, somebody else also sees, but silently, silently, nobody knows what they have done. You just read, you read through, you don't know what the games that they are playing. But it can't be the words. But he says only one. We're just talking about one. <laughs> Why are you so particular? I said, you know, in a court of law, when you bear testimony, and when you said, well, I only took one, then you say, I took none. But I said, the judge says, you said one just now. He said, well, you see, I think maybe it was a slip of the tongue. You know, you can be charged for perjury, bearing false witness. Even one is a contradiction. But I said, look, since you are so... You want, you want me to over this one little point? Let's look at this. In the second book of Chronicles, chapter 9, verse 25, it says, And Solomon had, has a Suleiman alayhi salam, he was a king and a wise man. He had 4,000 stalls of horses. Then in another book of the Bible called One King, First King, chapter 4, verse 26, it says, And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses. Did he have 4,000 or did he have 40,000? How many did he have? They said, look, it's only a question of a, a knot. Look, very ingenious. They're all ready to answer you. I said, look, between 4 and 40, is just a zero was added by mistake, maybe. Or a zero dropped off. I says, no, zero, not. I says, no. My Jewish cousins, they didn't, they didn't know the zero. You know, zero is a new invention. 
and it was given by the Arabs to the Western world. Zero. Without zero, we couldn't have all these sciences. You know that? With those Latin figures, you know, M, so, so, mm, to tell you a thousand. And that type of writing, millions and billions, you're going to write. How? All this, you're working, calculators, you need the zero. Zero is the greatest invention of man. And it's our Arab brethren who gave it to the West. The Jews didn't know zero when they wrote this. They used to write in words. Four in Hebrew, F O U R four. Forty, F O R T Y forty. So that now the difference between four and forty is thirty six thousand. It's not only one. Thirty six thousand. What have you to say now? It's a well a man can make a mistake. Yes, yes. No doubt. Man can make mistakes. But you say this is the word of God. That God dictated. So if God dictated, then the fault is God's. God made the mistake. That is what we are taking exception to. Can you see? If you say man writes and you know, he was maybe he was tired or he had some, some mandrax or what. So and the guy, you know, instead of saying four, he wrote 40. We can overlook people's faults. But not God. If you say God wrote it or God dictated it, we have a right to take exception. So look, you're attributing a lie to God now. Four or 40. Now the Bible gives us a test of how to find out whether a thing is from God or not. Beautiful, beautiful. In the second book of Timothy, Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16, every Christian, in previously they were quoting this, but they have gone out of now. It seems to be worn out, this, this verse. 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration. Scripture means the holy book given by inspiration Allah's wahi and is profitable for doctrine number one for doctrine teaching what you should believe what you shouldn't believe doctrine for reproof you do something wrong say look out you see you do such and such a thing you are adultery so you'll be stoned to death or whatever you steal so go to jail whatever reproof Look out. Doctrine, reproof, correction. He said, no, 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 not like this, my son. You know, this is the way to do the job. Or instructions unto righteousness. Four. And I'm asking learned men of Christendom, can you find a fifth heading under which you can put the word of God? Fifth. I haven't come across one in 40 years. No Christian with the name has ever been able to come forth with a fifth. I said, nor can I. I'm not saying that I'm cleverer than you. I can give you the fifth one. Beautiful. Anything, if it is from God, it must be under these four headings. It must be your doctrine, reproof, correction, or instructions unto righteousness. Right? He says, right. So I said, right. Now let's analyze. I give you one verse. Just one verse. From the book of Judges. Chapter 16, verse 1. Book of Judges. Chapter 16, verse 1. It reads... Then Samson, Samson went to Gaza. Look, Gaza is in the news. You know where Gaza is? Yes, it's, these Jews are, you know, knocking, you know, killing our children there. That's Gaza. Gaza and West Bank. Gaza and West Bank, you keep on seeing it on your TV. Gaza. If I said this about a month ago, you wouldn't know where Gaza is. Yeah, you know now, Gaza. You know where Gaza is? So Samson went to Gaza. And he saw a harlot. Harlot, a whore, a prostitute. He saw a harlot. He saw a harlot there and he went in and to her. Full stop. Halas. That's all. What more you want to know? I'm asking, where does this fit in? Into the word of God. This guy goes to Gaza and he sees a harlot, a whore, and he goes in and to her. Finish. God doesn't give him AIDS, he doesn't give him VD, he doesn't give him gonorrhea, nothing. He doesn't reproach him, hey, what the hell, you know. Moses said, thou shalt not commit adultery, that the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. Nothing, 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 not one word. Go and read the whole chapter, you will never find another word. So where does it fit in? If it doesn't fit into your doctrine, nor to your reproof, nor to your correction, nor to your instructions unto righteousness, then it fits under pornography. 
You give me another heading. It's pornography of the highest order. Glorifying adultery. Little wonder that Ian Fleming, the guy who did the 007, you know, James Bond. I saw it, you know, from Russia with love. <laughs> I did see it. You see, you just, I, I was shocked. Really, I was shocked, you see. This guy, James Bond, 007, he goes, wherever he goes, he sees a beautiful woman and he goes to bed with her. He goes somewhere else, he sees another beautiful woman, he goes to bed with her. He says, as easy as like eating peanuts. <laughs> Where did he get the idea from? Ian Fleming. I said, yeah. Samson goes to Gaza, he sees a harlot and he goes in and to her. <laughs> no, you're laughing. You see, they're making a mockery of God. If you say this is God's word, you're making a mockery of Him. That's why I'm showing you all this. But it makes people to laugh. Not only look, you just wait a little. You know, you're going to burst out laughing. Wait. Allah gives us another test. He tells us about the relationship between Islam, the Quran, and the previous revelation, the kitabs. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa anzalna ilayk al kitab bil haq. Allah says it is we who have revealed the book, the Quran, in truth. Musaddiq al lima bayna jadi min al kitabi, confirming that which was revealed in the previous scriptures, confirming that which was given in the previous scriptures min al kitabi wa muhaiminan alayhi and a quality control a guarding in protection of the book of the revelation of god this book the quran allah gave you to confirm what is true if they say that god is one is akul huwa allah ahad say they say thou shall not commit adultery the quran says la taqribu zina a little step further don't go even anywhere near it so whatever the book says is worth confirming, this book confirms. And it is a quality control. Don't go out of bounds. Anyway you go out of bounds, this book says, wait a minute, check it. It's not so. Quality control. Here, I give you an example. Exodus. That is the second book of the Bible, chapter 31, verse 17. It says, that the Sabbath, Yomu Sabbath, Sabbath, you know, they're not supposed to work, the Jews, they're not supposed to work on Saturdays. So it is a sign between me, as if Allah is saying, and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Allah, you know, look, any imperfect body to maintain yourself, you know, you get tired and you need rest. But now you're going to support other systems, do other work, you get tired more, more. The greater need for rest. So God Almighty, He created the heavens and the earth in six days. And on the seventh day He rested and He was refreshed for another set of activity. That's what the Bible says. The Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلَكَدْ خَلَقْنَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ We created the heavens and the earth. Wama bainahuma and everything in between. Fisita tiyam in six days. Wama masana milugub and nor did any sense of weariness, tiredness overtake us. Allah Bariz. He created the heavens and the earth and everything in between in six days. Days not necessarily meaning twenty-four hour days. Though the Bible goes out of its way to tell the mankind that it was a twenty-four hour day. It goes out of its way. It says, and the morning and the even was the first day. And he made this, and the morning and the even was the second day. And he did that, that and the morning and the even was the third day, and on and on. That in morning and evening is 24 hour, 24 hour, 24 hour day. In the Holy Quran we are told, there are times when we say, Ramadan, we're fasting, say, Ayyama Ma'duda, for a few numbered days, that is 24 hour days. Then Allah says, a day in the sight of Allah is a thousand years of your reckoning, depending upon what you are talking about. Another occasion in the Quran is a day in the sight of Allah is 50,000 years of your reckoning, depending upon what angle you are looking at. So it is a period of time, whether 24 hours, whether a thousand years, whether 50,000 years, or 50 million years, or 5 billion, or 50 billion. No, it's a period of time. However, whatever it is, he says, but Allah does not feel fatigue or tiredness in 
his creation in doing what he does. In the surah Kursi, Ayatul Kursi, we are told, Wasiya Kursi of Samawati Wal Ard, and his throne extends over the heavens and the earth, Wala Yauduhu Hifzuhuma, Wahuwal Aliyul Azim, and he feels no fatigue, no weariness in, in guarding and cherishing his creation. The Quran says that, the other one says he got tired and he rested and he was refreshed. Quality control. Again, Jesus Christ is made to say in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 10, verse 27, so, but looking at them, Jesus said, looking at them, Jesus said, with men it is impossible, certain things man can't do, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Allah can do anything. And we take no exception to that. Allah says so in the Holy Quran. He says, Fa'alu lima yurid. He says, He is a doer of all He intends. Whatever He wants to do, Allah can do. Holy Quran, chapter 85, verse 16. Surah Nahal. The Quran confirms. Jesus said, With Allah, with God, everything is possible. He can do whatever He likes. The Quran confirms. He says, Fa'alu lima yurid. He says, yes, Allah can do. He is a doer of all He intends. Whatever He wants to do, He can do. But the Bible now contradicts that. In the book of Judges, chapter 1, verse 19, it says, So the Lord, God, was with Judah. Judah. Father of the Jewish race. From whom we get the word Jew. Judaism. Judea. Jude, Judah. So the Lord, God, was with Judah. And they drove out the inhabitants of the mountains. With the help of God, God Almighty is helping Judah, the Jews. And with that help, they, they drove out the inhabitants of the mountains. But they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland. Because they had chariots of iron. They had tanks, armored cars of those days. So God couldn't do anything, poor chap. He failed. He couldn't help Judah. For the highland people, God could help Judah. Knocked hells into them, threw them out. But now when they go to the, uh, the, the lowland, those people had chariots of iron, tanks, armored cars of the day. Poor God. He couldn't do anything. So, I said, you see, quality control. Allah says, no, for lima yurid, he can do what he intends. He's, there's no tanks and armored cars or spitfires or anything can come in his way. Whatever he wants to do, he can do, he can accomplish. The Bible gives us another test. It gives us a test. I said, let's apply this test. Second Peter, second book of Peter, chapter 1, verse 21. This second Peter has been in dispute. There's a problem about second Peter. Among the Christians, it was not accepted as a canonical gospel up to four centuries after Jesus. The Christians themselves didn't accept it. This field, there are learned men among the Christians, they said Peter didn't write but now, man, let us see what he says, if he wrote it. He says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Prophecy, telling people what is going to happen in the future. It didn't come in olden times by the will of man, whims, fancies, your impulse, whatever you felt like talking, you talk, no, no. But holy men of God spoke, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Whatever the Holy Ghost told them to say, they said it. That's what prophecy is. He said, all right. So God Almighty, through the Holy Ghost, we say, Achi Jibreel, Archangel Gabriel, being the Wahi, they said, now whatever he inspired people to write, they wrote. So let's examine. We examine, it says here, that before Jesus was born, his mother Mary is told by the angel that this son of yours, Isa, he will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David he will sit on the throne of his father David Dawud -Salam. you know he was a king, ruler in Jerusalem so God Almighty will give your son that throne he will be a ruler, a king sitting on the throne throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob Yaqub al-Islam's family Bani Israel Yaqub al-Islam had 12 sons they became 12 tribes the Bani Israel he will rule over the Bani Israel forever you know, forever. 
and of his kingdom there will be no end that's a prophecy poor Maryam alayhi salam when she got this news she must have been elated oh my son will be a ruler a king sitting on the throne of his great grandfather Dawud alayhi salam very good what happened instead of him sitting on the throne a mushrik is sitting on the throne Pilate and he's sitting in judgment on Jesus amazing he's supposed to be the ruler supposed to be ruling the Jews forever who's ruling in Israel now who Jesus and ask these missionaries who's ruling in Israel Jesus Christ he said he's going to rule over the house of Jacob forever you know what's ever yes ever means ever for all times who's ruling at the moment 2,000 years have gone where is Jesus he's sitting there on a hot seat in heaven so they say he's sitting on the right hand of God he's waiting till his enemies become his footstool who are his enemies Jews they are ruling there running amok knocking hells into the poor Palestinians hmm? and Jesus is supposed to be ruling forever and he'll sit on the throne of his father David this pilot fellow is questioning him art thou the king of the Jews so he says thou says that's what you say he said am I a Jew to tell you this is what your people say that you are claiming to be a king so Jesus says my kingdom is not of this world does that mean he's, he's sitting on the throne of his father David? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. May Konikrek is nif and hear the world knee. <laughs> then we read incredulous, incredulous fairy tales by God. Incredulous. In the book of God. I'm reading from the book of Judges, chapter 15, <coughs> verse 15 and 16. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. Who? Samson. This same Samson. You know, he went to Gaza. He's exploit. Now he finds a fresh jawbone of a donkey. You know this jawbone of a donkey? Reached out his hand and took it. And he killed 1,000 Palestinians with it. With the jawbone of a donkey. I'm asking, Shorosh. This one Jew boy, he killed 1,000 of you people. Damn it all, why didn't you run away, man? Why are you? And with the jawbone of a donkey, how did he do it? One thousand. What, they were lined up? Even if they were lined up, and where do you hit the guy? One, two, three, four. Can you imagine killing one thousand people with the jawbone of a donkey? And then he sings a song. Listen to his song. Then Samson said, he sang, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. I said, look, in Greek fairy tales, you don't find this. Huh? You believe that? What's up? film go at one time so this Samson fellow now he goes judges book of judges chapter 15 verses 4 and 5 he says then Samson went and caught 300 foxes you know what's a fox you can't catch 300 tame dogs you know that <laughs> if you try to catch a chicken chicken in the chicken run do you know one chicken this guy Samson he went and caught 300 foxes listen now hmm. and what he did with them and he turned them tail to tail took two tails you know maybe male and female he tied them up male and female tied them up he tied them tail to tail two 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 so he made 150 pairs then he put fire between the tails and he told them to go for the fields of the Palestinians and they went and they set fire to the Palestinian groves and olive groves and, and wheat and all that. These foxes, poor thing when you tie them, you, you look fox, fox, you know what's a fox? Wild things, man. You know, you can't even train dogs to do that. You know, you tie their tails, they want to run one either way. But here he tied them up, two, 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 he made 150 pairs. And then he put fire, 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 and he told them where to go and they went. <laughs> I said, you know, the Greek gods couldn't do anything like that. Hmm? Then I said, you Palestinians, very valuable people. You know, your foreskin, foreskin. You know, we do khatna. You know khatna? Circumcision. Circumcision. Circum means right round and scission means to cut. You know, the skin. Now, it's very worth, it's a valuable thing for dowry. You want to get married? You want to marry a king's daughter? 
for dowry those skins if i had time i'll tell you a joke about the jew you know how he was catching fish with it but we don't got the time <laughs> one samuel book of samuel chapter 18 verse 27 it says therefore david arose and went he and his men and killed 200 men of the palestinians these palestinians are there they're just ready to be killed <laughs> That's their destiny. Allah as if he's got destiny for them. You just get killed by the Jews. Hmm? Now he goes and kills 200 Palestinians. And David brought the four skins. The skin in the front he brought. And they gave them in full count. One, two, three, four. He counted out his dowry. 200. To marry the king's daughter. Mishal. He married Mishal. 200. One, two. Like one pound. Two, one round, two round, three round. He gave out this. In full count. Exactly 200. Not 199. 200 we are paid out in full I said you Palestinians man what is God got stored in for you what has he got for you aha uh -huh. you know God Almighty he hates them so much these Palestinians according to the book according to this Jewish book the Bible he tells them he says look telling the Jews you kill the Palestinians men women and children nothing that breeds must live even ox and camel and sheep and goat and donkey. Even donkeys are not to be spared. I said, what has the poor donkey done? Huh? Look, imagine, God Almighty, he hates the Palestinians so much that even the Palestinian donkey must not be spared. <laughs> but now God is more merciful. On this occasion, this one occasion, in the book of Numbers, chapter 31, God says, now, you must only save for yourself virgins of the Palestinians. You see, little children, kill them. Suckling, kill them. Because you've got no time to rear them. You have a boy or a girl, kill them. Little children. Male, female, kill them. Because you save a girl. Man, you're going to start by the time she's 14. You know, amount of food and shelter and protection you give her. A waste of time. Destroy them. Kill them all. But when they are ready, 14, 15, 16, yes, not those... Also, you must be on guard that they must be virgins. Yes, which no man had known sexually. Soldiers in the field are given instructions. Look, when you see a Palestinian girl, you must verify that she is a virgin. The only way is to rape and ravage her. Ravish her. There's no other way. For a soldier, how is he going to find out whether the woman is a young girl is a virgin or not? And if they found she is not a virgin, chop off her head. Not virgin, chop of her head. And they saved for themselves 32,000 women, which no man had known. And they were the first to rape and ravish. How many? 32,000. How many they murdered? It doesn't say. 32,000. God giving such instructions. Hmm? Can you imagine any nation on earth giving such instructions to the soldiers that when you meet, you know, of your enemy nation, when you meet young women, verify. Rape and ravish them. That's the only way you can verify. And once you verify that, then mm, this was too easy. It's chopped off of the heads. <laughs> but you know, God Almighty, He also wants to share. God wants to share now out of that, the raped and ravished women of the Palestinians. He loves them so much. So it says here, and 30 and 2 was for the Lord. I'm asking, what does the Lord do with raped and ravished women? <laughs> huh? What does God do with them? You tell me. Little wonder, Allah says, So woe to them who write the book with their own hands. Then says, This is from Allah. That they may read from it some small reward, some small benefit. And woe to them for what their hands do write. And woe to them for what they earn. Now they say, This Shorosh fellow, at the last meeting, if you by the tape you'll hear him he said you know 75 percent of the Quran in my glorious language Arabic 75 percent is copied from the Bible is plagiarized stolen from the Bible Muhammad copied it from the Jews and the Christians. what is the Quran He copied it from the Jews and the Christians 75 percent I'm asking what is there to copy what have you got that's worth copying look my friend Jimmy Swaggart, he has been writing many beautiful books. 
homosexuality, Sodom and Gomorrah, pornography, the preacher. In this book, ah, there's one on incest. It's here. Ah, oh, it's inside the book. Incest. You know what's incest? You see, when you go with somebody else's wife or daughter, commit sinner, it's called adultery. But when you do it with your mother, that's incest. When you do it with your daughter, it's incest. With your sister, it's incest. With your daughter-in-law, it's incest. And there are ten cases of incest in the Bible. Different, different cases. Ten cases. Father with his daughters, father-in-law with his daughter-in-law, son with his mother, brother with his sister, as if this is a textbook on incest. If you want to know what, what type of incest you can commit here, you'll get the reference book. The Bible. So I said, what is there to copy? And there's not one of them is copied here. There's not one case of incest in the Quran. Not one. You got ten. What did Muhammad copy? That Christians themselves are saying, ban the Bible call for glorifying violence and sex. The Christian women is crying in England. Ban the book. George Bernard Shaw, he says, the most dangerous book on earth. He said, keep it under lock and key. Your children must not have access to it. The Plain Truth magazine, the editors, they say that many a censor will give it an X rating. Cross. The Bible. This is a Christian publication, The Plain Truth. They say many a censor will give it an X rating. So what is there to copy? If Muhammad copied it, the things that I can give you from the Bible, you know, as a key, the details. I don't want to. My sisters and my daughters are here. I don't want to. But I tell you, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, if he was writing on his own, if he was an imposter, and if he had copied these things, he could have made the Quran the bestseller, world's bestseller. I'm telling you. Because the Arabs would have left it up and no problem for him. They wouldn't have given him any problem. The Mushriks of Makkah. You know, they gave him, persecuted him, he had to flee for his life, you know that. But had he copied the Bible about all the sex and the pornography that is there, it would have, man, the Arabs would have lapped it up of the Ayyamul Jahiliyyah, they would have lapped it up. And they would have said, Muhammad is a great hero, no problem for him. Unfortunately, fortunately, he didn't do that. Now, this book, Making Mockery of God. That God Almighty is a barber. You know barber hairdresser? Isaiah chapter 7 verse 20. It says, in the same day the Lord will shave with a hired razor. Not his own hired razor he's going to shave. With those from beyond the river. With the kings of Assyria. The head and the hair of the legs. He's going to shave your head and he's going to hair of your legs. How high it doesn't say. You know from the toe to the thigh is your leg. Now he's going to shave. God Almighty is going to shave. You tell that to a barber today, he'll chop, he'll cut your throat. You tell him, he said, come, shave, shave, clean my... He said, man, go and buy some wheat. <laughs> God Almighty, he says, the head, uh, says he's gonna, uh, the head and the hair of the legs. And he'll also remove your beard. Your beard also. What are you making God to be? A barber? Hajam? Hallak? They call them Hallak in... in then God Almighty, you know, He's giving ideas. The Bible gives you ideas. You've seen people smoke. I've seen our people, you know, smoke a bit too much. I was watching, I was sitting, standing outside, and the people come in. And just last minute, they want to have the last few puffs. But you see some of our brothers, you see when they smoke, and then they, they make rings. You've seen that? Yeah. I've tried it sometimes. I failed. I couldn't do it. Then there are others, you know, who smoke and they, they, they take out smoke from the noses. Huh? Where do you get the idea from? Where do they get the idea from? From the Bible. It says smoke went out from his nostrils, Allah's nostrils. <laughs> smoke went out from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. You know, the dragons. Saint George and the dragon, you know. Fire coming out of his mouth. Devouring fire. Coals were kindled by it. That's how Allah the, the burns coal. And he burns, you know, like the flamethrowers. I don't know whether you've seen it sometime in the films. They throw flames. So 
so God Almighty, and he burns coals with it. He bowed the heaven also, and he came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew. What is a cherub? He knows a cherub. You see, an angel is a beautiful woman with wings. You go to the art gallery, when you, I don't know about here, Durban, museum complex, city hall, Durban. You go to the second floor and you see the beautiful paintings by great artists. Among them, there is one there about the angel, well proportioned, 36, 24, 36, with wings. <laughs> but she appears to be about 25, 24, 25. You know, that's an angel. A cherub is a 12-year-old, 14-year-old angel. You know, a little girl, crisp, crisp. And God Almighty is riding her. Listen, 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 I'm only reading. He says, and he rode upon a cherub, this young thing. Allah bari ta'ala, astaghfirullah. He's riding upon a cherub, this young little crisp angel, girl, about 11 or 12 year old angel, with wings. And he flew, like Superman. You know Superman? You know how he flies? With his mind. You know that? You don't see anything there, he just does well like that and he goes. <laughs> but, <laughs> they're telling us that God Almighty, he needed this cherub, you know. And he's flying about, what you, what you making, my Allah? Why are you making mockery of God? See, this is making a mockery of God Almighty in this book. And you say, this is Allah's book. Allah writing that, he's telling you to write that he writes cherubs, cherub little, little girls, he's riding them around. Uh, he couldn't do what the Superman does. Astaghfirullah. Then God Almighty, in the book of Isaiah, He tells His prophet, Isaiah, that He must go about naked. Absolutely naked. Not even a G-string. You know that little, little, little <laughs> jock straps you wear? Not even that. No, no, no. He said he must go about naked for three years. He must run around in front of his mother, his daughter, his sisters, everybody. He goes around and a prophet of God, God Almighty, made him to go about naked for three years. You believe that? That Allah does that? He says in the Holy Quran, He says, Qul, tell them, Inna Allah la ya'muru bil fahsha. Allah does not command anything shameful. This is a shameful thing. Telling his prophet that he, this is what he must do, go about naked. And he commands another prophet. In the book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces. You know what's dung? What about human dung? What do you call that? This is talking about human dung, not cow dung. Spread dung upon your faces. Allah will do that on your faces. Even the dung of your solemn feast. And one shall take you away with it. Then Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 12 says, And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes. He's telling his prophet. Allah is telling his prophet. To eat that thing what he's going to make now as barley cakes. And thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. What you see from fresh, fresh, fresh stuff. Not the thing that's dried up. <laughs> Not the dried up one. What you see fresh that's come out of man. That dung, you must bake it with that, and you must eat it. Who? His prophet. Allah is telling his Nabi to do that. Allah says, Inna Allah la ya'muru bil fahsha. Allah doesn't command anything shameful. <laughs> then he tells another prophet, Hosea. Then the Lord said to me, he says, Allah told him, Go again, love a woman who is a lover by a lover, an adulteress. Allah tells him, go and get a wife of adultery. Zina, zani. Go and marry her, an adulteress, committing adultery. Just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who took other gods and loved to raise them. Inna Allah la ya'muru bil fahsha. And Allah bari ta'ala, he eats also broiled fish and honeycomb. You know that? He eats fatted calves. This is what Sharush, you know, in the last debate, if you see that, he tells. He said, you see, Ibrahim alayhi salam was sitting, and he sees three Angels appeared, three persons, they appeared, they materialized, like what you've seen in Star Trek, Star Trek, you know, the people in the spaceship, they, they dematerialize in the spaceship and they appear on some planet, and from there they disappear and they appear again in the spaceship. So three angels, they appeared. 
So Ibrahim alayhi salam, thinking that they were visitors, so he goes to them and says, look man, come, 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 you know, I'll wash your feet and I want to be hospitable to you. So they come inside, they sit down. And Ibrahim alayhi salam tells one of his servants, the fatted calf, the nice fat calf, kill it. And he takes his wife, he gives some flour and some butter to his wife, he says, come on, quickly, quickly, bake some cakes. And he set the table. And, and they ate. Who at? He said, God Almighty, Allah. Shurushes, when he said Lord, that means God, Jehovah. And the two angels, they at. Paid barkar khana khaya. They fill themselves. And then the two went to Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels to destroy, and God went his way. He walked away. What does the Quran say? You see, he said, Allah Baritala tells you that look, the three angels came to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Confirming that. The Quran confirms. And Ibrahim alayhi salam took all the trouble to set the table. And they sat down to eat. And Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Bismillah, get started. And they're not eating, says the Quran. They're just staring at Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ibrahim alayhi salam gets terrified, naturally. You, if you have visitors, come to your house, you do everything, prepare the table, and you tell them, Bismillah, get started. And they're just looking at you. The fear. So maybe they have evil intention. Maybe they want to steal his wife. Maybe they want to kill him, rob him. So he's terrified. Why is it that the people are not eating? So they say in the Quran, Allah says, that they said that we are the angels of the Lord and we don't eat. There the Bible says, Allah act and the angels act. So Allah says, Qul, tell them, غَيْرَ اللَّهُ وَاتَّخِذُ وَلِيًا Say, am I going to take anyone other than Allah as my Lord and protector? فَاتِرَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ When He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. وَهُوَ يُتَعِمُ وَلَا يُتَعَمُ When it is He who feeds but is not fed. They say, Allah eats. The Quran says, Allah only He feeds you but He doesn't eat. This is not His. Angels don't eat. God doesn't eat. These are the qualities of man. What's wrong with you? No. So, correction. وَمُحَيْمِنًا عَلَيْهِ My dear brethren, you know there is so much. Let me end this talk, give you people an opportunity to ask questions. In the ayah I began, uh, let me end with the ayah from Surah Bani Israel, that is chapter 17, ayah number 88. Bismillah rahman rahim Qul, tell them. لَإِنِ جِتَمَأَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ أَلَا أَنْ يَعْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ Say, tell them that if the whole of jinns and mankind, if they were to gather together to, to produce a like of this Qur'an, لَا يَعْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ They will never be able to produce a like thereof. وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْتٍ زَهِيرًا Even if they help one, backed up each other with help and support. This book is Allah's book. And there is nothing like it that anybody can produce. We Muslims must become conversant with this book of Allah. Get a translation? I know the direct is Arabic. If you understood, I understood, it will be the best. The second best is through a translation. Get a translation and acquaint yourself with what Allah says and share it with our fellow countrymen, our neighbors, our friends, our employees or our employers. Share it with them. Thank you, Brother Ahmad Dirat. There was a message sent to the stage earlier. I could not interrupt the talk. It says that the following cars will be towed away. A brown Datsun, CA149702. A green Datsun, CA409028. A Toyota Avante. CA575236. If you are the owner, please attend to it. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard how Brother Ahmad de dealt with the topic on which is God's Word, the Quran or the Bible. The hall is very full, but we have a microphone placed in front of the stage. If you wish to put 
a question pertaining to what was said, then please come to the microphone. I beg of you that I'm here to control the meeting and I would like to say to those people who are perhaps not coming to put a question that whoever comes to put a question should be afforded the opportunity and the dignity and the honor of having his question put in a civil manner and without any interference. I would stop you if you interfere with him but likewise this is not a debate, it was a lecture and I did say at the start that you are entitled to come and put a question. Please, I would not like to stop you against your wishes, but if you come to give a lecture then I'm going to stop you. And please put one question at a time, and if there are more than one person, then you put one question at a time and go back to the end of the queue. It's pretty awkward, please facilitate matters. If people want to get to the microphone, please let them do so. Thank you. I, you see, this was, some people are unfortunate that they didn't hear a thing which Mr. Didat said. They only watched his actions because I'm convinced that a number of the people can't hear. I've asked earlier on that the ladies should be seated and the men should be standing. If you can still fit them in, please do so. So there's a microphone. In front. Mr. Dirat, where in the Bible does it say that an angel is a woman? You don't have to look for that in the Bible. This word cherub. If you look up the Oxford Dictionary, he will tell you what a cherub is, and what is a cherubim, and what is a seraphim. So you get it there. And if you go to the art gallery, as I said, and every Christian painting description you find in Christian literature, angels are always women with wings. Or not always, most of the time. You'll find the drawings of a beautiful woman with wings, and they are described as angels. Okay, I don't see it in the Bible. The second question is just on the actual Holy Quran. Uh, I haven't actually seen your copy of the Quran. Could you possibly just read to me what's on the cover of the Quran? This particular one I have in my hand, it says the Holy Quran, text, translation and commentary by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Thank you. Uh, is that inspired? What is inspired? What you just read. That cover? No. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the Bible as well, the term Bible is not inspired either. We agree that the cover is not inspired. The text is inspired, not the cover. So the fact that Bible does not appear in the Bible does not mean that it's not a Bible. It's an idiom, it's a term. Yeah, when you say it's an idiom, I agree with you. Bible means a book, coming from the Greek word biblos, which means a book. Whereas the Quran names itself. The Bible doesn't name itself. Can I possibly ask another question on that particular? You read... Uh, if there are any other questioners, of course. you give them a chance and then you come back. If there are none, you may continue. If there are none. Please make it possible for those people to come through if they wish to ask questions. Can I possibly ask while I come ahead? Yes. Yes. The next question is, you read from 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17, which says that all scripture is God-breathed and is inspired for teaching. You also quoted from the book of Luke, uh, and you, you brought out certain points there. 
Now, as far as I understand the Bible, when it says all of Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, Scripture attests to itself, i.e. Scripture itself is saying that it is inspired. The Bible does say itself, that it does attest to itself, that it is inspired. That's why when Jesus quoted from the prophets, he said uh, that the Scripture says that this Scripture has been fulfilled in your presence today. Right? Scripture is self-attesting. Is there a question that you would like to put in? It's a rhetorical question. All right. You see, I gave you that as a test. Now, when Paul wrote that, there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. This is what your Bible scholars they tell us, that Paul wrote this about 25 years before any other book that was ever written. So he is not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke and John or Acts. He is talking to Timothy about the scriptures which he as a Jew had learned. And the thing is to test it, put it to the test. And I gave you examples how to test it. This, anything if it is from God, must be under these four headings. And I gave you Samson and I can give you Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 25 and I can give you Ezekiel chapter 23, the whole of it. And we know that no decent man will be prepared to say that this is what came from God. Which I would be ashamed to read unless you are prepared to. And I give a commentary on Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 25 about that siren. You know, a voracious, a voracious sexual woman. You know her. I don't know whether you know the If you know the Bible, you know her. I do know the Bible. Praise right. the Lord. Right. Chapter 16 verse 25. This is the insatiable lust. See? Opening. You, you said uh, you don't want me to repeat it. I'm sure you don't want to repeat it either. No, I would like you, if you think that this is God's word, to read it to the audience and explain now what it is all talking about. I will do that with the chairman's consent. You may, seeing it's a request you. coming from the speaker. Thank you. Can I repeat uh, what you said? You said that I must read it and explain it. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Uh, which chapter do you want me to read from? There are two particular ones. Chapter 16. 16. Ezekiel, verse 25. Verse 25. That's right. I Ezekiel, would appreciate silence while it is being Ezekiel read. Ezekiel 16, verse 25. Correct. If there is anybody else who wishes to make his or her way to the microphone, please start now. All right. Ezekiel, verse, Ezekiel 16 verse 25 says, Thou hast built thy high place at every head of the way, and hast made thy beauty to be a board, and has opened thy feet to everyone that passed by and multiplied thy whoredoms. Right? That is what the Holy Scripture says, inspired by a holy God. What it means is that the prostitute has opened herself up to everybody uh, of certain nations. Now, what the Scripture means is that this is figurative language. Right? It is, if you look at the context, I will read context if you want, but I doubt if you've got the time. But the context here is figurative language. It's not speaking about one specific woman. It's speaking about the nation of Israel. And what it means is that there is only one God. We don't deny that. And because there's only one God, there's only one way to God. There's only one way to serve God. There's only one law. And what the nation of Israel had done was they had prostituted themselves to the other nations. They had said that there is another way to serve all these various gods. They had gone a whoring after the gods. Now, we ourselves have to choose, as Israel had to choose, between whether we serve the one God with his one law, or whether we will run from the one God with his one law. We believe the Holy Scriptures right. teach what the one God says. 
Sorry, uh, does that do justice to your commentary? If, the, if Mr. Dinat is happy that that is what the verse says... No, the verse says that, but you see the things that are being omitted there. The word there, you read feet just now. In Hebrew, it is not feet. That's right. No, we, right. we do not, agree with that. Right. That's right. In Hebrew, it is not feet. That's right. It is legs spread out. That's right. We right. agree with that. And we this woman, she is prepared to pay her customers. She is prepared to pay. Unlike the harlots of the world, she is not that type of a harlot. She is not that she person. She pays worst. you. She is the very worst. She, she pays you That's right. we for agree. doing it's to her worst. what you do to ordinary women, with, with the, to prostitutes. Now, this that's is what the, the Holy Scripture this, does this, say. That's what it says. Now, right. this, that what you read just now about feet, in this fifth major revision of the New Testament, uh, uh, of the Bible, King James Version, the word feet are cut out. First it was the legs, the legs of the women and her thighs were cut out. Now, you got the feet there, in this one the feet are also taken out. So you see now, this is what I'm telling you, that this is not the word of God, that even your learned men are ashamed to leave even feet inside. You see, that the, the, the legs were sprawled out, they changed the American version to say, the feet were sprawled out, and now the feet are also taken out, the word sprawled is taken out, and the word feet is taken out. I said, what game are you people playing? Therefore, I said, look, you, if you believe that this is the word of God, you would never do any such things. Uh, can I respond to that? No. Now you give somebody else a chance. There is another person this is behind. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I missed the boat. Uh, my, my, we... my Bible. Huh? Okay. Yes. <laughs> you want the Bible or the Holy Scripture? The Bible. Uh, we do agree that the translations do differ and that the, the translations very clearly did uh, did uh, put it down very subtly and uh, I think that there is a lot of wisdom in doing that but uh, for me personally I would like the scripture to be read as it is in the original languages which subsequent translations do do as for example my Bible the New International Version just one of the many translations would not say feet it would give a more literal translation of that particular scripture the scriptures are useful for salvation and therefore we need to understand what they are saying right thank you very much the yeah, next question please lower the microphone otherwise we won't hear you mr dirat you it has been mentioned tonight that uh, Hannes soros said that that 75 percent of the quran is uh, written out of the bible I don't know very much about that, but you believe that the Quran is Nazir. What do you mean Nazir? Nazir. What do you mean Nazir? <laughs> what I'm, why, why don't you give me what you have in your mind, your meaning? What, what meaning have you got? Well, that is something that has been sent down from God. Right, right, right. right. Yes, Tanzil. It has been sent down. It has been yes. sent down. Yes. Right. So you believe it has been sent down, it's an inspired word of God. What's your question? My question is simple as this, sir. You believe that the Quran is the inspired word of God. Do you believe it? Is that the question? Yes, and I'm willing. Right. 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 Just a little right. one question. Please. Right. Will you take your turn if you have another question? No, I want to qualify that. No, just a little. Your, your question is... I want to qualify, that's why I asked that, you see. Just a little. What is your question? The does Mr. Didat accept the Quran yeah, because, as being? Yeah, because, because if I could prove to you out of the Quran that there are pre-Islamic, what you call, uh, passages that are in the Quran, that is pre-Islamic, that are come down from other books besides the Bible, like the Talmud and the Jewish folklore. I can read the folklore to you and I can read the... Yeah, but now just hold it. Your question is, does Mr. Dirat believe that the Quran as it is today was sent down by revelation? Yeah. His, his reply to that was that he accepts it. Yeah. So I want to qualify that by reading the Quran. Yeah, but just hold it. Uh, we could have okay. the next question, okay, please. Uh, yes. Mr. Didat, you said that the 
God said he created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. And was refreshed. Yeah. And uh, you believe that the Quran is the ultimate miracle? Look, I spoke for one and a half hour. Are you I listening? I said I spoke for one and a half hour. I gave you numerous references. Thank you, Mr. Dan. To uh, say that, look, the book, that the Bible that you're holding in your hand is not the word of God. And none of you are taking a single exception to what I had said. Not one. I want to know whether you people are listening. I'm telling you it is not the word of God, the book that you're holding in your hand. Right. And you, nobody's answering that. You're not questioning me on that at all. I just want to quote to you out of the Quran. The Quran said in Surah 25, 59, the world was created in six days. And there's another chapter that said the world was created in eight days. In Surah 41, verse 9 from to 12. Now, how can, can you explain to me the ultimate miracle? How can who, it be the ultimate miracle? Who, who's talking about, who, who, did I ever use the word ultimate miracle? Yes. When? Uh, Tonight? Three years before. No, 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 but I, no. <laughs> hold but it, hold it. Is the, is the Quran the ultimate miracle? Can you, can you answer me that? Uh, just a minute. I did, I would like to qualify that I asked specifically, can you please don't quote what was written five years ago or what was said ten. I said what is said I'm here tonight. I'm the uh, Quran. No, no, I'm saying now, uh, his question is, did he say so tonight? So That's it can't what be an uh, ultimate miracle if these two verses contradict each other. The one says six and the other said eight. Now explain to me that. Right, now give me that reference to eight. You said eight days. Just give me the reference. I'll check it up for you. Give me the reference you gave. It's Surah 25. 25. Just one second. Verse 59. Right. 2559. And the other one is... No, 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 I'll deal with that. See, the six days we had agreed. The Bible said six days, the Quran says six days. Now we're talking about eight days. Let us see what it says. He who created the heavens and the earth and all that is between in six days and is firmly established on the throne of authority. God most gracious, ask thou then about him of any acquainted with such things. There's nothing about eight days here. Well, I'll, I'll put you the other one. You read the priest, the other one, please. Oh. Shh. Shh. Um, Surah 41, from verse 9 oh, to 12. 41. You had told me 25, 59. 41? From verse 9 40. to 12. Let me get one. 41 first. 41. From 9 to 12. 9 to 12. Right. Right, I'm reading now. 9. Say... Is it that ye deny him who created the earth in two days? And do ye join equals with him? He is the Lord of all the worlds. He set on the earth mountains standing firm, high above it, and bestowed blessings on the earth and measured therein all things to give them nourishment in due proportion in four days, in accordance with the needs of those who seek sustenance. Moreover, he comprehended in his design the sky, and it had been as smoke. He said to it, and to the earth, come ye together, willingly or unwillingly. They said, we do come together in willing obedience. So he completed them at, as seven firmaments in two days. And he assigned to each heaven its duty and command, and we adorned the lower heaven with lights and provided it with God. Such is the decree of him, the exalted in might, full of knowledge. So four plus two and two is? Right. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, you see, there is a very comprehensive commentary. If you read the commentary, if you read the commentary, it would have answered your problem. But unfortunately, you see, you're just now quoting something and you don't read what the whole thing is all about and you're jumping into conclusion. Best thing, if you haven't got this, you remember the previous questioner asked, what book this is. So I said, this is a translation by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Right, I've got that very you, same one. Right. You get that? No, I've got it. Right. That's then you I read the it. commentary, it answers your problem. Uh, 
Right. But I don't agree that the Quran is the ultimate miracle. You see? No, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question coming to the microphone. Shh, silence, please. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Dr. Didat, what day is it today? Is that the, just, oh, let's, uh, uh, just, yes. just one thing, minute, please. Uh, I'm going to allow you one question, so please ask the pertinent question, and yes. otherwise if you're going to have one I leading to, up, I, I might stop you at the wrong place. That's right. I want to relate it to the scripture. I want to know what day it is today. All right, I can answer that to you. Thank you. It's Tuesday, the 12th. It is Tuesday, the 12th. Right. Home, 1900? 88. 88. When has that started? What means 1988? No, 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 no. You're referring to the year of the law type of thing. The Lord. Yeah, that but means now the Lord this. has created that day when the start of the Bible, of the New Testament. From that day, when you go back <coughs> to history, 640 years has the Quran been written. All right, well, now what is the Yesaya, question? Sorry. Uh, what is your question to you? My question is, how do you know what you believe is true? Thank you. Thank you. Right, take your turn. Go to the back. <laughs> you see, there are numerous, numerous reasons which makes me to believe that this book is true. Numerous reasons. Number one, this book was given through a man who didn't know how to read or write what we call an ummi in Arabic, unlettered. He brought this book about. The very physical size of this book, if this was Muhammad's production, compared to the Holy Bible, 40 different authors wrote this book. 40 different people went along to produce this book. This is one man job. Who said that? I said that. Which man? Who said that? I said that. Now, now. <laughs> no, 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 no. Thank you. Please, 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 please. Please, please. Don't do that. You see, this book, this book supplies the answer to what Jesus said. He said, I have yet many things to say unto you but he cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. This book guides mankind into all truth, meaning solves all your problems. The Holy Bible doesn't do that. Jesus Christ himself, he says, I got many things to say, and you are incapable of receiving it. And he didn't give you, and nor a the Holy Ghost has told any church in, in this past 2,000 years, solution to the problem of race, solution to the problems of alcoholism, solution to the problem of surplus women. There are dozens of problems to which this book does not give an answer. Whereas Jesus Christ prophesied that there's somebody coming after me and it is he who will give you solution to all your problems. Then in the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 12, you read there a prophecy. He says, and the book, the book is given to him that is not learned. And Ummi saying, Iqra, read. And he says, Ma anabi qarin. He said, I'm not learned. The book, what book is, is he talking about? Which prophet said, I am not learned? Now, if you read the history of Muhammad, his life, the first revelation that was given to him in the cave of Hira. The archangel Gabriel comes to him and commands him in his mother tongue, Iqra, read, and he says, Ma'ana biqarin. I'm not learned. A word for word fulfillment from the book of Isaiah. Then in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 19, it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he, that prophet mentioned in 1818, speaks in my name, so I will require it of him. Now, he said, that prophet speaking in my name, in whose name is Muhammad speaking? The Lord's name. No, 
It says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. So, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Kula Uzubir bin Nas. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Every chapter of the Quran begins with the formula, In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Now, these are all the fulfillments which goes to prove that the Quran is the word of God. If oh. the Quran is the word of God, then it must not borrow its, past, its material from folklore, Jewish folklore and traditions. I might read one... All right, just hold it, uh, sir. I did say that you must put a question to Mr. Dira. Yeah, well, I'm just saying... So can you put that in the form of a question? It might be a very valuable point and then I stop yes. you. This is, this is simply to disprove that the Quran is the, uh, and the word of God. I want to read this passage of scripture, uh, this passage from the Quran, 27, Surah 27 from verse 17. And there was gathered together unto Solomon his armies of jinn and humankind and of birds and they were set in battle order. Sir, thank you. Now, what is the question to that? I said, please put that in the form of a question yes. and you'll get an answer. Right. If this is the word of God, why is it borrowed from the Jewish folklore? All right. I, I've got to read another passage. No, no, I think your point is made that... Uh, I'm going to read the Jewish folklore to you. No, no, we, there's no time. We, your, your point is well made that why, if the Quran is God's word, why did God take yes. from the Jewish folklore? Yeah, because the Jew, Jewish folklore predates, predates the... Uh, Islamic advent. Yeah. Yes. No, thank you. Thank and you. And I very got much. the Jewish folk all me here. No, no, I know about it. It's all right. Thank you very much. I can much. read it to you. Your question is well taken, please. You see, if you read the book of John, the last chapter, Gospel of St. John, chapter 21, verse 25, the last verse, it says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. That means there will be so many books which are not here. Does it say that? That if the, all the books that were written about Jesus, if they were to be contained in a book, even the whole world can't contain them. So there could be other things which are not recorded here. That's what the implication is. Then you read in the Old Testament, in the book of Joshua, is this not written in the book of Jasher? It says, that another place, another name. There are ten books. There are ten different books mentioned in the Bible which are not in the Bible. I, I wonder if you know them. Yes, uh, Mr. Mr. Dirait, the, the Jewish folklore is not scripture. It's legends, it's if, myth. If this was written in the book of Jasher, and if God Almighty has it copied from the book of Jasher, that means it must be something valuable. If God Almighty is having it copied from the book of Jasher... No, it's not uh, the God Almighty copied from the Then who? Uh, it was Muhammad who copied it. <laughs> he plagiarized it. Uh, uh, right, uh, thank you. Could I have the next question, uh, please? Can I read it, please? Sir? Can I read the Jewish folk? Uh, no, I, uh, look, I, I, your point is made and I accept it. But you, had, you did you receive your answer. Could I have the next question? Would you mind going to the back of the queue, please? <laughs> Silence, please. Thank you. Another rhetorical question. The claim that the Bible is not the Word of God and that nobody has refuted that tonight. Let me say unequivocally, without any shadow of doubt, that this is the Word of God. All right, could I Thank get you, some a message in, please, if you don't mind? There is a cause alarm that's going off. A Toyota Corolla GIX-CA575343, the alarm is going off. I'm sorry, sir. Thank you. I just want to uh, ask, if the Quran has a comparable passage, John 3 verses 16 to 21, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him 
shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son sorry this is the verdict uh, basically you want to know as the, as the Quran got a verse comparable to that where it speaks of God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son no no can I read the rest of the passage just so that you can see what the question is I'll give you one more shot okay this is the verdict light has come into the world but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil sorry thank you I, I do believe that Mr. Dida gets the drift of you I'm sure you would like to reply to that the question I haven't understood at all you are reading verses but what is the question can I read the remainder of the verses so we can give the question no, could, could the, I, I think basically the, the question depends on the remainder of the verses all right put it this way your question in essence is has the Quran got a verse comparable to that is that correct now can you just read that last portion of the last the most right. potent one okay everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God thank you the question about whether the Quran has something comparable is can the Quran give one the assurance of eternal life now uh, because of what somebody has done on one's behalf or is one left in uncertainty for the whole of eternity you're referring to the and doctrine no. of atonement referring to the doctrine of atonement Jesus dying for, the, for others that's right, right. Don't, don't, Mr. Dida. well the Quran tells us that illa tiba zan, that you are all following conjecture, guesswork, fiction. All this idea, the Quran says, is fiction. Wa ma qataluhu yaqinan, for of a surety they killed him not. And if you read the Bible, your Bible, the one that you have, New International Version, if you read it and if you analyze it, it's not what you are thinking. You see, Jesus Christ, when he returned, look, this has got nothing to do with the subject, really the question question was before us one and a half hour the Quran or the Bible which is God's Word and now you are taking us off all at a tangent and you want me to deliver a speech that is actually no, no that, I don't want to deliver a speech that, that's actually the, the what you are now posing you read almost half a chapter of John chapter 3 verse 16 and onwards what you're looking there now <laughs> look the whole audience know that you read about half a chapter there and now you are posing certain things now we have to speak to you explain to you about theology now this does not prove that this or that is the word of God I gave you examples from the Quran and the Bible which makes the Quran to be the word of God and the Bible not to be the word of God and you still you have not asked a single question with regards to what I've said I'm telling you the Bible you're holding is not the word of God you haven't done anything to prove to the contrary or to answer my allegations, whatever I said, I said, look, this Samson going to Gaza and going into the prostitute, having sex with her. Your new international version says he spent the whole night with her. That's what your book says now. This book tells us plainly he went in unto her. He means he had sex with her. And that one you are carrying there now, what does it say? It says he spent the whole night with her. What, worshipping her? What was she doing there? No, can you I answer see, question? Now, this, this, you, your question on my subject. I said the Quran or the Bible, which is God's word, and I gave you numerous examples to say these things disqualifies that book from being called the word of God. Was marked dua. We make dua that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala must bless us all with the insight, so that we can counter the onslaught with fact and not by getting wild or hot under the collar for nothing. Shukran, Zazilan. Assalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته
Uh, good, good evening to everyone, Mr. Chairman. I just want to ask one question. The word is, is the word of the Bible true or is the Quran true? Is that a fact? Is that question being directed at Mr. Dia? Yes, sir. Mr. Dia. You see, I was giving you references where Jesus Christ is to contradict himself. Jesus makes a statement that of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Simple basic English. You don't need a dictionary for that. I have lost none. Previous chapter he said, I lost only one. <coughs> now you tell me which of these two statements is true. One of them is definitely not true. Uh, one or none. So you see, now this is the whole story. The, everything is the same story. I have been giving you examples that God tells his prophets to go about naked. The Quran says, no, he doesn't instruct anybody to do anything shameful. Between the two, I'm asking, leave religion one side, which is true. That God Almighty will tell you to go about naked in front of your mother, your sister, your daughter, or will he tell you to cover yourself up? What would he do? Our common sense, sane reasoning says, God will not tell you to do any such, such shameful things. Yes, I agree with that. But, uh I'm not condemning the uh, Quran, I'm not condemning the Bible, I'm just a new Christian, but I say there is Jesus because in the word of Jesus, I have seen people heal. At, at the touch of the word Jesus, I have seen people's heart being restored. Uh, I'm not going to argue further with it, but I say I'm not worried about the Bible so much and I'm not worried about the Quran so much, but I'm, I say in the name of Jesus, there's power and people can be cured. And if you want... Uh, some uh, examples of it, I've got a hard case, uh, a Muslim lady who was from R.K. Khan's hospital, who was sent down to home to die, but today, today I can bring her and she's still living. No, that's a question. I say there's still power in the name of Jesus. Thank you. You see, brother, you know, all this boast about healing people with heart troubles and cancer and some Muslim lady was healed. Look, the hospitals are full. If you ever been to King Edward VIII hospital, you know, when you see there, your heart bleeds for everybody. <laughs> King Edward VIII hospital, go there and help the people there. Instead of running around to Muslim homes, you say, you know, this Muslim lady had heart trouble, she had cancer. Look, Thousands of our brothers and sisters, you know, Africans, Indians, colored, they are dying. And you are wasting your time running from door to door when the, the customers are there by the thousands every morning. Why don't you go and help them? However, this is, this is a rhetoric question. I'm not, I'm not asking you to respond. But the fact is, look, this is the obvious thing. If you had the power, God gave it to you. Go to the hospitals. Help the people. Instead of wasting your time running. This is an extremely important gathering and I must ask you to treat the gathering as well as the speakers as indeed people who ask questions would do their call. Please find the shop, raise your voices. And pause at an appropriate time might be acceptable, but please try not to exceed the bounds. You have a question, sir. Mr. Didat, I'd like to say to you that the Christian had no power to heal the sick. We don't do no healing. If we could do healing, we will empty R.K. Khan's hospital. And if we could do healing, we will empty every hospital in the world. We don't do the healing. Only Jesus does the healing through us. And I want to say something not relating to the topic. I'd like to ask the chairman if I could. No, you, you, you are allowed to ask questions at this stage, not to make statements. It's great to make matters to the public and daily. Well, I won't be long. I just want to make one statement. You keep us here for the entire night. Perhaps a gentleman Just not even half a minute. I'm sure Mr. Dirat would like to hear what I'm going to say. Mr. Yes, Dirat? Sir. You may ask questions, not make statements. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave unless you want to put a statement in the form of a question that might be accepted. Would you like to phrase your statement in the form of a question? All right, I'd like to ask him a question. Please. How much of power does the Quran has to save a person's life, give him a joy and a reason for living like the Bible? 
And just one more thing before you answer me, Mr. Dirad. The Quran has no power on earth to change a person's life. And hear me out. It is a dead book. It is unreachable, unidentified. I think you've lost the question. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dirad, and hope it sink into your spirit. Thank you. Silence, please. Silence, please. You see, this is the proof. This is the proof. This is not unique to this hall. I delivered the same talk in Johannesburg, and there were droves and droves of Christians, missionaries, and we allowed them one full hour for questioning, and there was not one question on what I had said. There is no Christian born who can contradict anything that I said tonight. There isn't one born. Irrefutable evidence I have given you. Now you have to come and tell me that this chiru was a flying saucer or it was a, a helicopter. Tell me, tell us, tell these people here. No, there isn't. This is what happens. Allah describes it to us in the Holy Quran. When truth is hurls against falsehood, it knocks out its brains. No questions. I tell you, I guarantee there's not, there are no questions. No, this, this is a lesson for the Muslims. That look, Allah has given you that power. I tell you, there isn't a Christian born who can answer what we have presented tonight. That this is not befitting the majesty of God, the language, the stories. I, I haven't come out with the whole. I just put them aside. I said, look, I'd rather give you a chance in case you said, look, this guy spoke for two hours and he's not giving us any chance. There's hardly any questioner. Look at this. They droves and droves in Cape Town, droves and droves. And they set the words in the, through the grapevine. Don't go and ask thee that questions. You're going to make a fool of yourself. So they don't want to come forward. So you make charges. What has the Quran done? I said, look, Islam through the Quran, through this one verse, it eliminated four major evils. One verse. I quote, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu. Say, oh you who believe. Innam al hamru most certainly intoxicants, wal maisiru and gambling, wal ansabu and fortune telling, wal aslamu and idol worship, rizzum min amri shaitan, are an abomination of Satan's handiwork, fajtani buhu la allakum tuflihun. When this verse was revealed, wine barrels were emptied in the streets of Medina, never to be refilled. The most perfect, complete, and lasting revolution in the history of mankind. One verse. And the evil was abolished for good. No more idol worship, no more uh, fortune telling, no more alcohol. This one verse created the biggest society of teetotalers in the world. The Muslims are the biggest society of people who don't imbibe alcohol. Look, this one verse did it. What are you talking about, dead book? This book with all your miracles, with all your miracles. Ask Swagat now with all his miracles. You worship him. I know the, my Indian Christian brother. The lies that he has been speaking. Jim Baker, the lies. Gorman, the lies. Can't you see? Bluff, big bluff. What are you talking about? Look, in South Africa, alcoholic consumption. Statistics, statistics, they tell us that the Muslim is the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. These are your statistics. They have no statistics for Africans, they have no statistics for Indians. But they say the colored community, five times the amount of alcoholics as any other race in the country. Five times the amount. The Malay is a cut. It's a Muslim cut. That's the identity the Muslim Malay, the lowest in the country, the Christian colored, five times the amount of any other race in the country. This is what your book has done. I said 8% of the white people who read this book, incest, 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 are committing, creating, are committing incest. 13% of the American people are committing incest. What are you talking about changing your life? I want to know what life it has changed. What is this? Come forward. Look, I said, that what I have presented to you, I presented a case to you. I said, look, this is not befitting God. This is not the word of God. Contradictions abound. You say, one or none, 36,000 
difference. 440. Jesus, come on, man, come on. And you want me to give you more? You read the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, verse 25, read it. No, you don't know the book. He said, not talk about the Bible. He doesn't read the Bible. He's a newborn Christian. He's a new Christian. He doesn't read the Bible. Jesus saved him and it heals people. What is this? I have spoken for an hour and a half. Were you listening? Was my English too hard on your ears? What is it? What has happened to you? No, the Quran gave the answer. Brains is knocked out. Come forward. Let's see these brothers here. If you have any question on the subject, come welcome. Our chairman. I'm speaking directly to chairman. <coughs> no one in this world ever knew the lamb. There's only one man that knew the lamb. To sacrifice and to get forgiveness for our sin and to redeem all of us from sin. All have sinned and become short of the glory of God. No one can enter into heaven without being the blood of Jesus to wash them and to cleanse them. One man, one man that is who knew the land. That's the question I'm, I'm talking about. I want I'm a desire to know who I'm talking about. Who is the man who knew the land and was it Yeah, but I'm giving the name of the man. I'll give you the name of the man that knew the land. What's it's, your question? My, that's what my question is. That the uh, Amr Dijad talking about Samson, right? Talking about Samson. Samson never born on his own. The angel was sent to the family. They born for the family to deliver the people. He had power. He was going to go ahead. You know that? Joe, a boom, yeah. He had power to kill those thousands. He didn't do it on his own. If you will no run. man can do it on his own. But he has the power. Yes. Power was given by God. Yeah, man. It's not a matter of criticizing. It's a matter of joking. It's a matter of serious. Bible is the word of God. God bless you. Do you have a question, sir? Assalamu alaikum to all the brothers, the Christians, whoever is Jewish, I'd like to direct one question to Mr. Jidat. This may be in reference to the discrepancies in the Bible. I may not have been here earlier, I've been here a bit late, but uh, the question is uh, the law of, of Moses is that uh, the first commandment is I am the Lord thy God thou shalt have no other God besides me for I am a jealous God so if that be if that is the case when did God become triplicate you see the question is this is you want to know God is one this was the commandment given by God Almighty to the holy prophet Moses, the first commandment. So here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. When he did this one God become a triplicate, three in one. Well, the Christian world in the third century, in the year 325, they deified Jesus. They made him into a God. See, they collected the bishops from all over, the Christian bishops, and they voted Jesus Christ as God. And they started believing in what they call the Athanasian Creed, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, but they are not three gods, but one God. This creed in the catechism of the Christians, Roman Catholic and Anglican, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, in your catechism, he says, the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty, but they are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. And it continues, the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person, but they are not three persons, but one person. This is the creation of the church. This is not the teaching of Jesus Christ. So we have to ask the Christians, where did you get this trinity from? Because Jesus didn't teach that. You see, in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 12, chapter 12, verse 9, a learned man of the Jew comes to Jesus and said, Master, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, what commandment is the first of all? 
And Jesus answers and says unto him in the Hebrew language, Shama Israelu Adonai Elohainu Adonai Echad. So here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's his teaching. It is no different from Islam, the teaching of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. In the fundamental, there is no difference. But the church has created these vertical triplicates, the triplicate God, three in one, carbon copies. And they're not even carbon copies. They're not even alike. See, triplicate is carbon copy. This three in one is not carbon copy because I'm asking the learned man of Christian them that when you say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, this is his formula of faith. Let me say the Shahada, he says in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. I said, how many mental pictures have you got? Three. And those three pictures are distinctly different. In his mind, the Father looks different, the Son looks different, and the Holy Ghost looks different. Unless the mind is diseased. They must be different. Father, I say in the name of the Father, they're thinking of that old Father Christmas sitting on some planet with the feet dangling onto the earth as his footstool, the loving father, you know, heaven as his canopy, millions and millions of times bigger than man, but something like a man. An old man with long beard. Father. Son. He's thinking of Jesus Christ, a handsome young man like you saw in the King of Kings or in Jesus of Nazareth. You remember with blue eyes, blonde hair? Yeah. God the Son and God the Holy Ghost. Something that came like a dove when Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist or something that came in flames of fire at Pentecost. There are three distinct mental pictures. Father looks different, Son looks different and the Holy Ghost looks different. And there's not carbon copies. They're not carbon copies. Carbon copies are identical. These are all three distinct and actually there are three they have in their heads. In other words, they're worshipping three gods, not one god. They say with the mouth one, in the mind they have three. So this is not the teaching of Jesus, this is the invention of the church. We have to help our brethren free them. That look even in the Bible, this verse on the Trinity, first epistle of John chapter 5 verse 7, is now thrown out as a fabrication from all modern translation. It's thrown out as a fabrication. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, is thrown out as a fabrication, as an interpolation. So God is not a triplicate, nor is he three in one. Quran says, Wala takulu salasa. Don't say Trinity. In lakum. This is top, it will be better for you. Inna Allahu wahid. For your Allah, your God Almighty is one God. He's not three in one, he's not a triplicate. Yes. Uh, Mr. Didiat, may I ask you two questions, please? Uh, One at a time. One yeah. at a time. Okay. And uh, which is, uh, from your point of view, which is God's word? The Quran or the Bible? <laughs> I'd, like to, uh, I'd like him to answer the first question, yes. then I'll give you the yes. next question. You see, you are like the young man. I was telling my friend Brian, you're the first questioner. I was telling him before coming in. I said, amazing situation. You see, you tell a fellow story about Romeo and Julie. You heard about Romeo and Julie? Yes. We have Layla Majnoon. You know, Layla Majnoon. Layla, Layla means she was a black as night and Majnoon was mad over this woman. See? So, whole night you're telling the story about Layla Majnoon or Romeo and Julie. In the morning, the clever fellow is asking whether Romeo was a boy or a girl. Whole night you heard the story, I'm telling you, explaining to you that the, Quran, the Bible is not the word of God, the Quran is the word of God, and now you're asking me, <laughs> which is the word of God? Okay, I accept that right, you said that the Quran is the word of God. Yes. Then explain this to me, Surah 41, 9 and 12. We read that the world was created in 8 days, but we read in Surah 754 that the world was created in 6 days. Explain that to me. Thank you. That's the last question. Right. This is, this was really a question. That's the only question tonight. First question. We must give him another applause. Really. Salama. I'm answering that brother there. I said, this was the first question tonight by God. He said, you see the Quran, we mentioned in the Quran just now, I read to you, that the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth in six days. The Quran says created in six days. The days are, we won't go into details, six days, six days. He quotes another chapter, chapter 41, verses so-and-so, 9, 10, 11, 12. 
He said, it says, God created the heavens and the earth in eight days. Now, he hasn't read. He's reading, thumb sucking from somebody. Somebody told him so, and he uttered the words. If he saw the Quran, the Quran doesn't say anywhere that God created the heavens and the earth in eight days. Never. No, 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 no. No, no. But look, there is some, some, there is some basis for his question. The Quran doesn't say. You see, like what I said, one man. That's a contradiction. Four, four or forty. That's a contradiction. If the Quran said six, eight, also contradiction. We'll have to admit. But the Quran doesn't talk like that at all. He doesn't talk like that at all. You see, he's tongue sucking from what somebody said. He doesn't know. If I give him the Quran, he can never find it. See, he will be able to read that God created the earth in two days and the earth and everything else in four days and he created the heavens in two days that's how the quran speaks two four two so he says eight you see these are stages stages god is talking about that the earth itself he started the creation two periods of time two eons two stupendous periods of time the earth and side by side with the thing that went on to earth this creation this foundation of the earth and this that took four days alone this work took two days this and that put together took four days and the rest another two days eons periods of time so now they said you see two four two that makes eight i says no 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 no. you didn't say eight now he's explaining to you how you are getting it wrong. And if he was here, this young man, I would have done him a favor. I said, look man, I want to give you some money. He deserves it. Look, he was the only first man to ask question. If he's here, if he can come forward, I'll be very happy. While the other brother is asking the question, please come forward, I have something for you. And I'll give it to you by God. Come, come forward. The young man, don't feel shy. Where is that young man? I hope he hasn't gone away. Come, come, come. Come, come my son, come, please, you deserve this, please come, come up here. Stand, right, you may ask the question, then I'll finish. Yes, your question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Abel Sheikh Ahmad Didat wrote, uh, the Bible is not the word of God with uh, providing reasonable solid facts. So my question is this, uh, being Muslims, we believe all the divine books revealed by God Almighty. So angel is one of them. So what is the angel that we believe in Islam? Thank you. Thank you. I think our brother missed the point when I said that we Muslims, we believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zabur, we believe in the Injil. And I said, that aspect is dealt with in this book. And this book is absolutely free of charge to everybody. What is the Torah? What is the Zabur? What is the Injil? I said, look, we have dealt with it before. I do not want to waste your time going into this aspect because it's already covered in this book. But briefly, Torah is a revelation, the Wahi, that God Almighty gave Musa alayhi salam. The Zabur is the revelation, the Wahi that God Almighty gave to Hazrat Dawud Alaihissalam, David. The Injil is the Wahi, the revelation that God Almighty gave to Isa Alaihissalam, Jesus Christ. Is the revelation, the revelation, the revelation. That is what we believe. That what was given was from God. It was genuine, infallible word of God. But where are they? See what they say now, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy is the Torah. This is, no, we analyze it. We will analyze it. And so it's not the words of Moses even. Right? Not besides being the word of God, it's not even the words of Moses. The Zabur, the same. The Injil, we have been doing it the whole night, is not the words of Jesus. The book, the New Testament. But the details are available in this book. As you go out, you collect this book, and you have the details. If you have any problem in understanding anything, then you come back to me. Inshallah. Now this young man here, I said he deserves a prize. 
I have with me three two round notes. I know it's not very much. Three two round notes. And I want to present it to him. So I said, here my son, two. Hold it, hold it. Two. Four. Right? Another two. How many did I give you? I gave you eight. Uh, Mr. Did I turn to know by you uh, uh, having these uh, debates and uh, trying to tell the people the Quran is the word of God and the Bible is not the word of God, what are you actually profiting or what are you actually achieving from this? You see, what I'm achieving is I'm disabusing the minds of people who are infatuated with the book. You know, infatuated, you fall in love. You are infatuated with the book. Say, look, this is not the book of God. Freeing you from those shackles that somebody has tied around your, 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 your head. Free you from those. And telling my people, they say, look, we are victims today. In this country especially, they're coming and knocking at our doors. They want to steal our children. I'll give you examples. Remember, this is Christian publication. What are they trying to do? Stealing my children. I want to teach them, train them. I said, look, when this guy comes along next time, you know how to deal with him. Yeah, the Jehovah's Witness comes along. So I said, tell him, page 13, open page 13. I didn't have time to go into all this detail, but if he reads the book, I said, open page 13. He opens page 13, what does it say? I said, Jehovah's Witness comes along, show him this. Is this yours? He says, yes, this is his trademark. Oh, wait. I said, you know it says 50,000 errors in the Bible? So what? I said, it says 50,000 errors in the Bible. Is it true? I said, I'm showing you how to deal with this guy. You come along, he said, look, you want me to leave the Quran and take this book. That's the purpose of the Christian. If you are a missionary, you have them by the thousands going and knocking doors. You know that? Or is it your forefathers were Hindus? Maybe you were yourself a Hindu. You are a new convert. How did you become a convert? Somebody came and knocked at your door. But they're also knocking at our doors. Muslim doors. I want the Muslim to know when this guy comes along how to respond. You see, that look, he is wanting you to change something good for something that is worse. I said, 10 cases of incest. There's not one in this book. Adultery, murder, rape, brothers raping sisters is there. Is there in, the, in your book if you're a Christian? There's nothing like that here. Bestiality is here. Look, I said, look, what do you want me to do? Leave this book and take this? For what? So I'm arming these people, they must know. And they discovered tonight, if they have any sense, that if the only master I have given them, there isn't a Christian born bishop or pope who can stand before any one of them. Just master this one book. Any Muslim masters this one book. There isn't a Christian born who can stand before them. But the trouble is, they're too damn lazy. That's the trouble. That's the purpose of this. That's the purpose of this exercise. Can I ask one more? Yeah. Can I ask one more? Yes. And uh, by you uh, having this uh, meetings, uh, what is the fruit? What fruit did you get out of it? I mean, uh, I want, uh, I'm not talking about bananas and apples and all. They may be thinking that because, as you told, you know, they are a bit carnal minded. You see. I mean, uh, what results did you really get out of it? By this, I mean, how many Christians came to you and said, Amma did that, Mr. Amma did that. Now I want to put down Christianity and I want to take up Islam because I've seen the truth in it. You know, things like that. We have converted, since we started the works, more than 6,500 people. Hindus, you haven't answered my question. Hindus, Christians and Jews. More than 6,500 my little office has done so far. Now, I want each and every Muslim to get involved. Every Muslim should be doing the job. 
is not one man's job, is not one society's job, is every Muslim's job. As every Christian is trying to do the work for his belief, the Muslim must do the same. And if one out of all this, if one fellow is benefited, my exercise is worth it. If I have saved one Muslim from falling into the mess, being tantalized for a Christian wife or some money or want to take revenge on his parents, he wants to become a Christian if he sees this, and it works. You see, there is a Jamal Khan, he is a Molvi in Maryville. Molvi, you know Molvi? Like our priest, Muslim priest. We have no priesthood, but take it. He is an Imam, Jamal Khan by name. He came to Verulam many years ago. When, when, when I arranged a lecture for him. He was in my house at dinner. And while at the table, he tells me, he says, you know, Mr. Didat, you saved my life. So I'm scanning in my head. I said, I know, so and so, something, my fellow was drowning, I pulled him out, and somebody else are there, I says, I helped him too. But when did I save your life? So he says, you know, around 1951-52, he said, your brother-in-law was in the Springfield Dormerton Hospital, TB Hospital. And you used to come there every week. I said, yes. He said, you see, at that time I was also a patient in the TB hospital. I said, so? He said, you see, there were Christian missionaries harassing your brother-in-law. And you came one day with the Bible. And you were showing them contradictions in the Bible. And he says, I was watching over your shoulder. I don't know. He says, I was watching over your shoulder. And what you showed them to the Christian missionaries, I saw and I tore up my certificates. I was training for the priesthood. Muslim! I was training for the priesthood. I was about to be ordained. And what I saw, I said, no man, I'm wasting my time. I'm barking up the wrong tree. So I tore up the certificates. He is a Molvi now, a priest in Marian Hill. Look, I didn't know. If he didn't tell me, I wouldn't know. And there could be dozens here. If they can, the, the faith can be saved by listening to this, I said, look man, where are you going to fall into this? Well, it, what this book has done to Gorman and Baker and Swaggart will do to you. What is doing to the Americans? 13% of the American people, they are committing incest with their own daughters. I said, you will do the same. 8% of the white Christians in South Africa are committing incest with their daughters. I said, you will do the same. So, I am trying to warn my brethren, keep away from this book. Bernard Shaw said, the most dangerous book on earth. But I want them to study it in conjunction with my book. Get this book and then use that as a textbook. This is a book of instructions and use this, it will be valuable. If not, you are also going to go the same way as Swagart. Uh, in uh, conclusion. I'm afraid we have two questions. I think we must uh, give up the last one. The last one. I hope so. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Didat. I must congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, for the calm way in which you've conducted the meeting this evening. Uh, I'm not going to accord the same grace to Mr. Dida. And that is the question I want to ask him. Obviously, I'm not of his faith and he knows me. Um, Mr. Dida, what I would like to ask you is you pointed out to us that in the Quran, it says that Allah is loving. What does Allah require of his servants? What does Allah require of his servants? If he is a loving being, yes. what does he require of his servants? Yes. Yes. What he requires from us, from all, is to believe in him and follow his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Listen to God, believe in God and keep his commandments. This is what he requires of you. You do that, he loves you and he will reward you. You disobey, you pay the price. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does in a way. I'll continue if I can, seeing as I'm the last one, perhaps you give me the license. Um, in, the, in the Quran as well, um, it says that Jesus Christ is a prophet. So you admit to the existence of Jesus Christ. What is your question? All right. You admit to the... So to what the, is your question? Because now, question what is, you are carrying on now, like in a court of law, you are not interrogating me no, no. as a public prosecutor. 
What is your question? I hope I'm not that. Your question. No. Your question. Tell, I, come right. to the conclusion of what you have in mind. My question is that Jesus Christ in John chapter 15 tells us that he gives all people a commandment, especially those who follow him, that they love one another as he has loved them. Why? Because he laid down his life for them while they were yet sinners. Now, that is the same love, I believe, that you are telling me that Allah is talking about. Therefore, if you are going to show love towards us, and I mean, you said there was 1.8 billion Christians who don't agree with you. If you were going to show that same love towards us, who are not of the same persuasion of you, why are you antagonistic? Why don't you show that characteristic of love towards these people, hoping to convince them of their error? Jesus Christ is described to be the most loving person on earth. He is supposed to be the Lamb of God, meek and humble. Well, listen to him, you generation of wipers, you brood of snakes, you hypocrites, you wicked and adulterous generation, you fools, you white sepulchers, you tell me. Who was he talking about? He's talking about his people. That's right. The scribes, elders of his people. The scribes and right. the Pharisees. So in other words, now if this was speaking for Jesus Christ, I never used any such language at all. Whatever I said tonight was more insipid than what Jesus has said. And despite the stupendous contrast between the language used by Jesus and me, you still say Jesus is the meek, humble Lamb of God. You still say that. He said, on his march on Jerusalem, if you remember, he said, for those my enemies who would not, that, we should, that I should reign over them, bring them hither and slay them before me, cut their throats. Did he say that? Did he go and beat people in the temple? Did I do any such thing? Look, I'm only speaking, I'm trying to reason. And it's a natural thing that if the thing goes against the grain, it makes a noise. The tongue. It's going against the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm allowed one more, just comment on what he said. Right. You know, the, the one thing I would like to say is, when Jesus Christ castigated the scribes and the Pharisees, the result was that they became totally estranged from him. I'm saying your attitude tonight has perhaps done the same. Thank you. Our young Ms. Lina, you have obviously done extensive research, clearly you're a man of education. So, I thank you on behalf of all Britain for sharing your interpretation, your knowledge and experience with us. All those who ask questions, thank you for asking those questions, they were indeed interesting. And lastly, to the audience, thank you for attending. Please give a quick stand up.